did try to fight, uh, but lost and ended up uh, fleeing to France. Uh, and William and Mary become king and queen. And it's an interesting relationship because they're king and queen in a kind of united sense because uh, um, she was related to. So, you know how that goes. Right? So, so pretty, pretty interesting stuff. Um, and uh, John Locke, who I'm on the wrong page to talk about him. Here's John. He is. John Locke is uh, going to be one of the counselors for them and returns them to England. Uh, William arrives on the first ship uh, and Queen Mary comes in the second ship and John accompanies her. Uh, that, and he, but he's connected then with that uh, king and queen uh, through, their, through their reign. Um, not only as a counselor, but also as a physician. He's also their physician. Um, and we'll see lots of important things with him, uh, including the fact that he is convinced by Spinoza not to accept pantheism as an explanation uh, for the scholastic definition of God, but instead uh, to accept the idea that you have to um, uh, appreciate the different people's uh, beliefs and so on. You have to accept them as uh, um, worthy of being uh, allowed to cooperate, if you, if you will. Um, uh, and that's going to influence Thomas Jefferson. So if you're, you're familiar with Thomas Jefferson and his argument uh, that um, there ought to be a separation of church and state. Yes, you've heard of that before. Where did that come from? Well, it's a very direct line from uh, Thomas Jefferson reading one of his heroes, John Locke. Uh, John, uh, Thomas Jefferson, uh, value, if you, you visited Monticello, which I had the chance to do physically, not just you know on Google Earth. I was physically there. Um, and we, uh, we saw the three paintings. He had Sir Isaac Newton, John Locke, and Francis Bacon, the three paintings that he had in his entry area uh, of Monticello. Monticello. It's, it's really a neat little house, actually. Uh, all the slave quarters underneath. Remember Sally Hemings? Folks familiar with Sally Hemings? And most of Thomas Jefferson's children were from Sally Hemings who was his cousin and his slave because his uncle had sex with one of his slaves which gave birth to Sally and then when the uncle died Tom inherited all of those slaves including Sally and he took her with him when he went to France on one of his trips she was a young kid and as she grew up she got sexy and Remember, Jefferson at that point no longer had his wife, and he had promised he would never remarry. It was his wife's you know, last request, and so he didn't remarry, and he did basically cohabit with his slave Sally. And as a result, when there's a Jefferson family reunion, uh, most of the people there are heirs of Sally. Very few of the other children. Yes, you guys are familiar with all of this? This is kind of interesting. And it's always brought up when we're talking about, well, you know, um, was Jefferson uh, um, two-faced? Not really. That's kind of, um, I mean, he said all men are, e are created equal, yes? Penmanship, beautiful, right? Um, all men are created, all men are created equal. Uh, and have the rights of life, liberty, and not really. That was life, liberty, and property. Except that most of the other members said, no, 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 I'm not promising property to everybody. Where are they going to get it from? So they hassled over that, 
haggled over that and ended up deciding, well, we'll make it pursuit of happiness. Now you can have that. <laughs> Go ahead and pursue happiness. I have no obligations to you while you're pursuing happiness. <laughs> Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So that's the ones that we get. So good, good call. You're right, actually, because uh, that's how we end up growing up, uh, getting that. Uh, but if you read John Locke, property was the other uh, one. Um, thank you, John Locke. Um, he'd be fun. We'll, we'll look at him uh, next class. And I'll, I'll send out some readings um, for him. Um, and who else? So, so we'll be looking at John Locke next. Quiz question for today. What was it? Do I remember? I think it's probably what do you think of Spinoza's conception of God. Um, what I need though is, um, I never pulled it up, did I? I never did. Uh, let's go back here. I want to make sure I get the right question because I never signed into Blackboard. Wow. in here too and I didn't even go to use it. think Spinoza is right, that God must be everything. By that definition, I mean, you know, if you think of God as Nefertiti, right, you know, obviously not, but uh, no, if, if you're going to use the scholastic definition of God, do you think that God is everything? And the way, um, in one of the books that uh, Pope Benedict the Sixteenth wrote, um, truth and tolerance. So there's that toleration issue again, tolerating other people. Um, and Pope Benedict said, yes, you should tolerate, of course, other people. But there's a dilemma, because what do you mean by tolerating another culture? Right? If you're a Christian and you believe you should proselytize Christianity because you believe Christianity is the best narrative there is, then you ought to teach people of a different culture about Christianity. But if you're doing that, you're disrupting or maybe even destroying the cultural traditions that they have, which isn't very tolerant. So that's a dilemma, right? Truth and toleration. Um, his name was Joseph Ratzinger. between Christianity and Buddhism is that the Buddha didn't believe in a creation a creation God so God or the Buddha is the universe same as Spinoza right? and that's Buddha had this way before Spinoza by the way of course right? remember Buddha would be the contemporary of Socrates and Confucius, so the axial age. Um, but if you're of the belief that God is 
the entire universe, then you don't have the belief in a creator, uh, a creator ex nihilo, right? Because you can't have God being in nature. And there's all kinds of fun things in the ethics of Spinoza to read about uh, um, the kinds of issues that lead to this pantheistic view, by the way. There's a lot of follow-up arguments that Spinoza gives which are really quite interesting, right? But um, strictly orthodox uh, would have to believe that God is other. And so that's the main difference, according to Joseph Ratzinger. Um, remember all along, too, I keep pointing out that, that you know, the main impact, the main goal in life that you get from these hierarchical uh, um, uh, religions is the idea of abstinence from attachment to the physical world. Right? And so you can see that in both uh, Christianity and uh, I mean, by the you know, religions that tell you if you join our church and you submit, you know, your tithe, you know, or even more, you know, you'll get hundreds of times, you know, back. You know, you'll have your new car, you'll have your Mercedes Benz, etc. That's not a Christian religion. That's a pagan religion. Because pagan religions believe that if you have the right secret words and the right secret ownership, you know, group, group, group that you're a member of, then that particular god will reward you for that. And, and that's really what Jesus is considered to have overthrown. That kind of, of interest. All right. I should shut up. Yes. Questions? Do you guys have questions? What's going on in the Middle East? Does anybody know? <laughs> I'm pretty sure everyone knows. Did the ground war start yet? That's the big I have no idea. Because Iran says, I think Iran's Ayatollah has said, shit will fly. And that's pretty onerous. We now have the two aircraft carriers and their escorts over there. And we got people in Syria, I think. So we'll see how that goes. I think we have troops there right now, so but they're not there for that yet. I think we have I think we have seven hundred and twenty bases around the world. Yeah. So We've got people in Syria. We've got people in Iraq still, I'm pretty sure. I don't know if any of them are friends of yours. I don't know if any of you have friends in Palestine or Gaza or Israel or Egypt. I mean, it's, it looks pretty clear. You know, you've got 600,000 people all lined up to go out the gate. And Egypt says, no, oh, not going to happen, not yeah. going to happen. And you think, what's going to happen? No water, no food, no electricity, no anything. And yet you've got all these people pushing at the gate. Well, thank you. Have a good one. You too. See you Wednesday. <laughs>